speaking to one of the most diverse and fascinating cohorts of master's students that we've ever had in our program. And so we've been struggling and, and I think very successfully and with a lot of great intention and a lot of thought this year with issues about how to talk about both diversity and inclusion and facing into matters of how to speak about race and ethnicity and identity in ways that are going to hopefully help shape the field. And this is the field shaper right here. And he's one of the busiest men in the country in oral history. He's had a years of devoted service to oral history while maintaining a radical edge, which makes him my personal hero. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> that's why I always have been described as big <laughs> and, and very much knee company. <laughs> so, um, we're just so honored that you took the time and that you come to your family to present to us today. We have a mutual uh, great, one of our great uh, heroes for each of us was Manning Marable, and we've been talking today about how when Manning Marable was recruited to Columbia, I guess in the late 1990s, early 2000s. 1993. Right, and this, we always like to begin with a story, and the story is, I was telling him that Brian Greeley and I were so grateful that Manny Marable wanted to come and visit our archive because he wanted to know if oral history at Columbia was really robust and exciting and could include a person like him. And um, so we spent weeks researching through all the Library of Congress categories and our collection of what interviews we had done dealt with race and social change. And so we had, I still have that packet we presented him, which is just a huge packet of information about all the interviews we've ever done that really deal with those issues. And he claimed that one of the reasons he decided to come to Columbia was because of this co connection between oral history and the academy and our collection. And unfortunately for Paul, who had just accepted going to the University of Colorado at Boulder to study with Manning, Colorado had a call to tell him that Manning was coming to Columbia. So that's our huge story. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> Um, so my name is Amy Starczewski, I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History MA program here 
Um, and tonight's event is part of our year-long series on oral history and public dialogue. Um, and so when I was planning this series, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a dream that Paul Ortiz would be able to come and talk to us about it. Um, and then when he agreed, I was thrilled. And when he sent me the talk title, I just was like, yes, that's exactly um, what I would like to hear Paul talk about. Um, so you know, Paul is, in my mind, you know, and Mary Marshall kind of alluded to this, um, one of the finest examples of a scholar activist that I know. Um, you know, just such the, the, the quintessential historian. Um, you, you hear Paul start talking about history, um, and just this, this like enthusiasm and this love of learning and talking and teaching about the past um, comes oozing out of him. Um, but also just one of the most dedicated activists that I've had the privilege of encountering in my life. And so it's really a treat to get to learn from you um, in that capacity. At the same time, he manages to be um, a really inspiring leader uh, as recent past president of the OHA. Um, and also a really incredible teacher. It's been incredible to meet some of your students um, at a couple of oral history annual meetings recently and see the way that they're so, uh, so inspired and so smart and so ready to kind of come out and, and be part of the world. And I think you get a lot of credit for that, as well as, <coughs> of course, them. Um, so more formally, uh, Paul's the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida, where he's also an associate professor of history. Uh, the Samuel Proctor Program recently received the OHA's uh, Stetson Kennedy Vox Populi Award, which is for outstanding achievement in using oral history to create a more humane and just world. Uh, they also received the Society of American Archivists 2015 Diversity Award for outstanding contributions in advancing diversity within the archives profession. Um, and that's much needed. Um, his publications include Emancipation Betrayed, A History of the Black Freedom Struggle in Florida, and the co-edited volume, with which I think many of us are familiar, uh, Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Tell About Life in the Jim Crow South, which just uh, went to, into its fourth printing, which is amazing. Uh, he's published in journals, including Radical History Review, Latino Studies, Oral History Review, Truth Out Against the Current, Southern Exposure, Works in Progress, and Florida Historical Quarterly. And he writes frequently for the popular press about African American and Latino <coughs> histories and politics. Uh, he's the faculty advisor for the UF chapter of the Dream Defenders, Students for a De Democratic Society, and Chispas. And he was awarded the 2013 Cesar Chavez Action and Commitment Award by the Florida Education Association, AFL-CIO. Um, so thank you, welcome, and welcome to all of you. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's really um, a humbling uh, experience, a great honor to be invited by my dear colleagues, uh, Mary Marshall Clark, uh, Amy Sterczewski, um, uh, and the students here. Um, and uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, we were talking about our mutual acquaintance experiences with the great uh, Manny Marable. And the last time I was actually on campus here uh, was the amazing um, kind of retrospective uh, memorial uh, conference honoring uh, Dr. Marable. That was a really emotional, powerful experience for, for many of us. Um, well, first of all, you know, I, and I also want to mention, when you think about the topic, I was asked this question earlier, and I've been kind of grappling with it um, this evening. Um, and the question was, when you do radical history in the university, in the college context, in the institutional context, you know, do you get pushback from the administration, and how do you deal with that? Um, and it's a kind of question that you can spend, we can spend hours talking about, um, but to get back to the introduction, <laughs> I teach my graduate students, and hopefully my undergraduates as well, that you know, being radical means you're trying to get to the root <coughs> of the problem. And that's the, the root meaning of the term radicalism. It doesn't mean left, right, center. It doesn't mean you're a Hegelian. It doesn't mean you're a Marxist. It doesn't mean you're a feminist. But, but you may use one or more of those methodologies to get to the root of the problem. In other words, you're not just putting a Band-Aid solution on a social problem like people living in poverty, people living with HIV AIDS, uh, people living with different forms of oppression. But in the academy, the way that I teach my graduate students how to be radical scholars is, look, we're always going to get pushback from our administrators. Radical faculty are like 
horse race, uh, uh, or, or like uh, race horses, right? As long as we keep winning races for the man, he's going to support us. Remember we used that phrase in the 60s, the man? I don't know if they still use that. And so the way you get away with doing radical work is you get results. Your research wins prizes. Our grad students win awards. They win grants. They do cutting edge research. And so yeah, maybe they may upset or irritate an administrator, but when, when they bring back home a dissertation award, Ford Foundation Award, a Rockefeller Award, things like that, that's that really matters to an administrator. Um, and getting outside recognition and doing excellent senior thesis projects. Uh, Lelani Montez is one of our former students here from UC Santa Cruz. Is she in the back? Uh, outstanding example of UC Santa Cruz, a wonderful student, did an amazing senior project. Um, was it radical? <coughs> yes. Uh, was it also distinguished by its research results? Yes, very much so. Excellent. Going to the root of the problem. So I wanted to kind of give a little more detail because I feel like that I was asked this question by the MA students earlier, and I've been kind of grappling with that. Um, in oral history, the other thing that really allows us to think about radical approaches to social problems and to, to have a bit more space to do that mentally and, and, other, and spiritually is we're going into a field which has a, an incredible legacy and a rich history, as Mary Marshall Clark and Amy Sterczewski can tell you, Ronald Greeley as well, of having people like Stetson and Kennedy, having people like Studs Terkel or Sandra Portelli, um, these amazing people who came before us who have created a space for any kind of thinking that we want to take part in, whether it's radical, conservative, Marxist, you know, Friedmanite, whatever. They have created that space for, I didn't, you know, I didn't create that space, um, Amy didn't create that space. That space has been created and fought and won for in military terms. And it would be shameful if we allow that space to contract, or we allow um, our top administrators or, or, or boards of trustees take that space away from us, uh, because we're we're the beneficiaries of that space, I feel. So when you look at someone like, say, George Rawick, and if you don't know who George Rawick is, you should know. Um, if you don't know who Manny Marable is, you should know. But this is what George Rawick did, and this is going to be a gross oversimplification. But in, in the 50s and 60s, this was a, a young, radical, irascible, could be aggravating, could be argumentative, um, could be a real tough person to kind of hang with, was often the most radical person in the room, um, but loved black narratives so much and felt that the ex-slave interviews that were done in the 1930s deserved to be collated, put into volumes, and rediscovered. Because these were oral histories done in the 1930s, in many cases were languishing in shoeboxes. We used to talk about shoebox collections, right? They were just sitting there in a library, not used. The interview had been done in 1935 or 36. The WPA project, the Works Progress Administration, and the New Deal, right? You're all familiar with the CCC, the WPA, so on and so forth. But Robert was one of those people who went around the entire country in the 60s saving these interviews and collating them, putting them back together, putting them to volumes, state by state by state. He wasn't the only one. There were many other people, Ken Lawrence and others as well. But the reason I'm telling you this story is that Rawick was one of these people that created a space for me, for Dr. Clark, uh, for Dr. Sterczewski, for all of you to do the kind of work that we do, where storytelling and narrative is valued in an institutional setting. And that's the kind of space I'm talking about that we, it, that we, we have to hold on to, frankly. Uh, we didn't necessarily create it, but on an everyday basis, when you do oral history, you all know that there is pushback that there are people that are skeptical. You know that there are people who question the methodologies that we use. Um, but it's important to continue doing this kind of work. Now, 
what I wanted to talk about tonight was kind of oral history on a couple different levels. One was oral history in the Black Lives Matter, or in the year of Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and to talk about the state of social movements now very briefly, but also to talk about what we've been able to do in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program to kind of support what our students are interested in. And Leilani can, can sympathize with, because she was one of my students at an earlier phase of my career at UC Santa Cruz. That was an amazing time. And that earlier era, in the early 2000s, there was an amazing immigration rights movement that was beginning to organize itself in California, in New York, and many other places. And it was a multifaceted immigration rights struggle, because there were students on campus, um, there were workers in Los Angeles and Chicago and Seattle who were beginning to really organize themselves. And women <coughs> were at the forefront of all these labor movement struggles. If I was to do a slightly different presentation tonight and to show you a presentation about the months leading up to the great general strike in 2006, and I was to do a presentation where we interviewed and talked to many of the, the, the movement organizers of that uh, strike in the central coast of California, probably seven or eight out of 10 of the leaders in the labor movement would have been a female first generation immigrant union organizers, business agents, reps, um, uh, you know, grievance uh, 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 committee people. And that gave what we were doing back then, back then I taught in the Department of Community Studies, um, that gave what we were doing a tremendous amount of, of, of uplift, I would say, because our students were, were wanting to know well, what's happening. Because in some cases, many of the women in the, in the immigration rights movement, um, they were not third party people. They were mothers. They were aunts. The men were, were uncles, were fathers. And so there were family connections in these movements between the students and the workers in the union movement. And sometimes the union would be the Service Employees Union or the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees Union ever asked me. Um, and that gave, that, that popular movement is what gave academic, um, uh, uh, oral history at that point, a kind of a special kind of uh, impetus and kind of force. The last thing I'll mention in the 90s, going back a decade earlier, <coughs> was the frontier strike. And that's when I first started grad school, the women in Las Vegas, that's when they made Las Vegas a union town again. And they literally reorganized the entire strip. And since that time, there have been many oral histories done with women, in fact, Clay T. White, uh, who is the director of the UNLV uh, oral history uh, program. Uh, Clay T has actually interviewed many of the women organizers. This is a union uh, composed of women from 86 different nations uh, on this planet. Uh, most of them uh, from uh, nations in the global south. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a backstory to let you know this is the milieu that people of my generation kind of come into the academy. There's a struggle happening, or struggles happening outside of the academy that have a big impact on what we do uh, inside the academy as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we do in the Proctor program. We live in an amazing time in terms of social movements, in terms of what's happening in the society, the current presidential campaign, and it has really pushed our students to ask new kinds of questions about how the society is organized, about whether or not I have a future in the society. On a very basic level, is my future going to be as good, or am, am I going to live, be able to live um, with relatively the same kind of, of, of dignity uh, and aspirations as my parents lived with? and have left behind to me. In other words, is my life going to be better or worse than my parents? In the old days, the stereotype was things were always getting better, right? That's kind of the liberal uh, theme in American history. You know, kind of, we call, used to call the Whig narrative. Um, but that question now is now a real question. It's no longer can we take that for granted. Um, and you see this happening in the past four or five years. Um, you saw it with the Occupy movement. 
Uh, you saw it with the Dream Defenders uh, in Florida. Because the murder of Trayvon Martin was not simply, you know, the, the organizing response to that murder was not simply that the, the, um, this vigilante had killed a young African-American male and the police did really nothing about it. The man was later exonerated. That murder highlighted a bunch of issues that young African-Americans and Latinos and white kids were dealing with in Florida. And that is, do I really have a future in this society? Not just economically, but in terms of political representation. If you look at who's running for office today, if you look at the Republican side, um, if you look at a person like, say, Marco Rubio, and who he represents in South Florida, who does he represent? Does he represent Cuban-American young people in their early 20s? Does he represent their parents? Does he represent their grandparents? There's a lot of turmoil in politics that, that is happening right now, and this is, these are the types of experiences that our students are bringing into, into oral history. That whether or not they're coming into, into oral history classrooms, or if they're just interested in doing a senior thesis uh, project. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in the Proctor program. This is a photograph you see on the right of a group of our students in a living room uh, with a SNCC veteran by the name of Margaret Block. Margaret passed away two years ago. Well, one of the things that we try to do is to put our students in very close contact with movement organizers. Uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our students come into the classroom interested in getting organizing experience, you know, being activists, or wanting to learn about how people change the society. Um, I can tell you a lot about the students in this particular frame. Genesis Laura, who's sitting there um, on the couch in the middle of flanked by two other students, um, her parents were involved in the revolutionary movement in the Dominican Republic in the early 1960s. Um, and many members of her family suffered political persecution. For Genesis to come and talk to a veteran of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Mississippi was a very cathartic kind of experience. Margaret Block was a person who suffered a lot of persecution, actually had to leave Mississippi uh, for many decades. She had a, a, a death threat on her life, or on, on her head, and it was actually spirited out of Mississippi and lived in San Francisco for about three decades. For them to be able to talk together about Genesis talking about her experiences growing up, learning about the struggle with the DR, and then learning about the black freedom struggle in Mississippi was a really important um, experience. When we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, we live in a, in a moment of crisis, uh, in an era of crisis, if you will. Uh, this is a murder that just happened in Gainesville, Florida, uh, the town that I live in, when I, where I teach at the University of Florida. Um, and this is something we have been in contact with. Uh, people have been calling uh, my wife and I about this. Um, there are reporters doing stories. Um, I was contacted this morning by the head of the Dream Defenders chapter, you know, to try to figure out, you know, the students are really trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to respond to this. This is another murder um, of a young black man in, in Florida. And without going, I don't have all the details to share with you right now, except to say that there's a tremendous amount of outrage. The police and the sheriff's department actually held a hearing and tried to control that hearing. That is, the police were the facilitators of the hearing. The community at a certain point said, this is not going to pass muster. Uh, we don't accept what you're telling us. The meeting broke up. Um, again, I'm getting more details about this. But this is what's happening today, every day, throughout the country. And again, our students and, and people throughout the country are organizing around uh, these issues of police brutality. This is another thing that's happening. And again, <laughs> I want to read this, but when this being kind of made the circle, yeah. a lot of us are, are looking at this and um, we just kind of laughed, you know. 
Because when you said something like this in the 90s or the early 2000s, and you had you were surrounded by colleagues, some of the very well meaning would say, you know, things are just getting so much better, don't you think so? <laughs> I remember that, you know, that, you, you hated to be, you hated to spoil the party. <laughs> and what happened, Amy, is you stopped getting invited to some of these parties, right? Because you'd be the one, oh, no, but this, this, you know. And so now, though, what's kind of cool about this in a way, I'm not going to say that, that I don't think Donald, there's anything cool about Donald Trump, but the one thing about it is no longer can we have these illusions that things are just getting better and better and, you know, the next generation will be better and more enlightened than the last generation. That's never the way history's been. That's never the way history's work. When you look at Latino history and African American history, and I'm finishing a book right now, on this topic, on these interwoven narratives, what you'll realize, if you take African American history, we're, today we're just down at the African Barrow, Barrow Ground. A group of African Americans won the right to vote in the immediate wake of the American Revolution, largely premised upon military service largely premised upon the fact that by the end of the war, approximately one out of five men who served under General George Washington were of African descent, okay? By the 1820s, that right to, to enfranchisement, very fragile as it was, was under threat. And in fact, state after state began to disenfranchise black men. Some states put a property requirement on black voting, where it did not exist or it was falling away under white voting, other states just banned black voting altogether. And this is what I mean by black history or Latino history doesn't work in an upward curve. We gain rights in one era and see them completely abrogated or taken away in the next era. I can remember when people said, oh, the Voting Rights is going to be here to stay. No one, the Voting Rights Act, no one's going to mess with the Voting Rights Act, right? They might complain about it, but it's permanent. And you'd say, well, do you know how the Constitution works? <laughs> this is not permanent. In fact, we are already living with the, the results. Um, Amy, I just read in Arizona, uh, apparently the primary was a disaster, right? People spent hours, and other pe uh, people say they're not being allowed to vote. And, and a lot of these things are happening because the Supreme Court guts the Voting Rights Act. And our students and people in society are responding to this. I grew up in the era of the war on drugs. That's what you heard. You had the so-called heroin e epidemic, the crack epidemic. The more literature that's coming out now is basically saying, and, and some of you I'm sure have heard this, Ehrlichman has basically come out and said, and again, these are statements, if you were a careful historian, you already knew this. You knew that the war on drugs was an anti-black war from the day one. Not day 10 or day 20, but day one. We knew that it was, a, it was also a, uh, uh, overlapping with that, a political war against any kind of dissent in society, right? And so Ehrlichman is talking about the blacks and the hippies. Well, you could, at, at a certain point, we know people who stop being hippies. But you really generally cannot stop being black. And so this is a, the drug war is a permanent war against black people in the United States. And that's what the system is saying now. It's not what Paul Latino is saying, or it's not what Ron Kelly is saying, uh, it's not what Manny Maribel is saying, it's what the people in power are saying. But they already have been saying this. There's already plenty of quotes from former Nixon officials, if you read carefully enough, where they say, this is about the blacks, this is about the Negroes. And so this latest thing, and again, oh, this has been, this, the phrase, the quote has been circulating around, and by the way, read the piece. Read the articles in Harper's. It's, a, it's really a tremendously powerful piece. Um, but a lot of people have been saying, well, we already knew that. Is this really news now? And, and why were people allowed to kind of have their heads in the sand and say, well, you know, racism, you know, uh, is, getting, is, is ameliorating somehow or, or it's lessening? The premise of the Donald Trump campaign is that um, if, you, if you look at CNN uh, and even MSNBC and a lot of outlets, what they'll tell you is Trump is speaking to people left behind by trade, by economic dislocation. But very rarely do they actually go and talk to people who work for Donald Trump. 
Isn't that interesting? What an interesting oversight. Because these would be the people who could tell you whether or not Donald Trump is able to help people stop being left behind by economic dislocation. And so when you actually talk to people that work for Donald Trump, people who make the money for him, that somehow he rarely ever talks about, people making around nine, ten bucks an hour, um, they have some interesting things to say about him. And they don't say they feel like he's going to somehow solve their problems, right? Um, and this is one, uh, and again, I'm not going to read any of these quotes, but, you know, I think he just cares about his business, how much money he's making. He doesn't care about me. He's the perfect Wall Street candidate. There's nothing insurgent about this campaign whatsoever. If you follow American history, this is a guy who's going to look up at Wall Street. And if you talk to his workers, and if you did an oral history project with workers right now in Trump Casinos in, LA, in Las Vegas, they have one of the major union organizing campaigns going on in the entire country. Did you know that? If CNN was really interested, if Fox, if NPR were really interested in talking to people who have been left behind in the global economy, they would be talking to Trump workers on the, on the, on the Las Vegas Strip. They have picket signs with the man's name on them. So what's going on here? Why is the media focusing on that? Um, what gives Trump, the, the workers that are working on the Strip, and this is Trump International, um, this is the facade of, 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 of the, um, I believe this is the Las Vegas facility, they've been picketing on a nearly daily basis, thousands of people picketing at, at Trump International. And what gives them a sense of, of courage is, is the organization, their union, Culinary Workers Union Local 226. And I wrote a piece in Truth Out about this several years ago. This union, and again, we, we have some, I play T and others have done wonderful oral histories with members of the, of the union. Um, that process of putting together a union, which begins with about 20 some thousand members in the early 80s and now is uh, a 60,000 member union local in Las Vegas, gives workers a tremendous platform to speak truth to power. And you'll hear these workers doing exactly that, right? And they're constantly talking about boss Trump. But again, their voices are not in the mainstream media. To me, if, if, if we're doing good work as oral historians, that's the first question we have to ask ourselves. Why are their voices marginalized? They're working for a person who is the most popular media icon going right now. And people say, Trump is good for the ratings, right? The head of CBS said that, right? I think that Trump is good for the ratings. We may not like him, but good for the ratings. And so why would you focus on the people that work for him? Uh, it seems kind of odd that, <coughs> that illusion occurs. We've been living in the past five or eight years in a very insurgent move, uh, moment in social movement uh, struggles. We talk about Black Lives Matter. Who are the rank and file activists? Uh, we're beginning to get some really good interviews and, and discussions with them. They are demanding the right to speak their own narratives. And so in the case of Arla Marie, she's a person who talks about intersectionality. She talks about sexuality. She talks about economic injustice. She talks about marriage equality movements. Um, and she's a person who asks really tough questions internally in the Black Lives Matter movement. And a person who I really think you know, is one of the organizers we need to think about as we're thinking about the, the moment that we live in right now. I think we live in a, a very insurgent moment. And if I was going to um, you know, kind of compare this moment to earlier moments, I'd say the earlier moment in, in some ways is the early 1930s, where we had this terrific economic shock. You know, if you were African American or Mexican American or Puerto Rican and you lived in East Harlem in the 19, 1931, and someone put a, a microphone in front of your face and they said, how is the Great Depression impacting you? And you'd say, you're just now getting around to talking to me? We've been in a Great Depression for 20 years now, right? But the reality is that now people are beginning to question the economic system in ways they were not questioning the system 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. 
And you're seeing the question happening at a lot of different levels. Now, I don't have time to talk about all the different levels tonight, except for the fact that one of the, the amazing things that Black Lives Matter has done is to help us ratchet open a space to talk about economic inequality. And the Deep South, and I know the Dream Defender chapter that I work with um, in Gainesville, a big emphasis of what they do is obviously you know um, anti-black violence by the police, but it's also economic justice. It's also the fight for 15. We need more organizing kind of on the ground um, efforts, but they're doing a lot of this in the Bay Area. And what's happening, I think, in the wake of the Great Recession is something similar that happened in the wake of the Great Depression. But it takes a while. And what's happening is that, again, more and more people are questioning the economic status quo. Are they talking about replacing it? Usually not, right? But they're talking, they're, they're asking question, hard questions of Wall Street, of corporations, of the Federal Reserve, of the US government. And these are questions being posed by workers at the very base of the society. Students are posing them because they're looking at lifetimes potentially spent in deep, deep debt. Why? Because we allowed banks to get into the, the college loan business. Well, that sounds like corruption to me. How did that happen? And, and again, students are posing these questions. But these narratives that, that from workers are, are beginning to, in many ways, resonate. Um, my wife Sheila and I went out and did restaurant visits in Gainesville, Florida. Talked to workers at McDonald's, uh, Wendy's. Uh, we, we talked with them, and, and they know the stereotypes. They said, look, you know, we're not kids, we're not teenagers. There are teenagers that work here. But many of us have worked at Wendy's or McDonald's for 9, 10, 15 18 years, sometimes these are the only jobs in our community, and we can't make it on eight or nine dollars an hour. And we know the stereotype. It's interesting when people know the stereotype. The stereotype is of right, what the young teenager, and this is their first job. And so why would you pay them a decent wage? But that that if you have your eyes open when you go into a Carl Jr. Carl's Jr. Is it Carl's Jr. or Carl Jr.? Carl's Jr. You see the people working there, okay? And when we went in and talked to the workers, it's interesting, many of them know the stereotypes that are employed against them to keep their wages low, to keep them down. And to listen to them is really to listen to what I think is an opening in terms of a, a potential social movement organizing, which is now just getting underway. And Black Lives Matter is a big part of that. A lot of workers that work in fast food are very interested in BLM, they're in Florida, they're interested in Green Defenders. When the Black Lives Matter movement begins to pick up momentum, this, this happens within the social movement. It begins to spread, the questions begin to percolate. You begin, when you have a social movement, you have what's called movement culture. Larry Goodwin talked about this in his book, Populous Moment. When you have movement culture and people are questioning each other, they begin to make connections. So earlier we saw connections between Black Lives Matter and the Fight for 15 movement, uh, justice for LGBT communities, and now it's a discussion that's been taking place within BLM is squarely about immigration rights, the immigration rights movement. And I think some of this, again, is connected back to 2006 general strike which had a big impact on, on workers, but you know, something that has kind of fallen out of the media time. Now I want to talk back to the oral history level, back to the Brocker program, to talk about some of the interviews that our students have been doing in the past several years. Now this gentleman, Ray Hinton, this is an oral history interview that we did last summer. And you'll see here Brian Stevenson, who's the director of the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, every summer, I take a group of students from the University of Florida to the Mississippi Delta to do oral histories with people who are veterans of the Civil Rights Movement. And earlier you saw a photograph of Margaret Block talking to some of her students. 
this past summer, we actually stopped for a day in Montgomery and did oral histories with <laughs> lawyers and people who, um, and former inmates who um, had been exonerated by EJI. And some of you are familiar with the work that Brian Stevenson has done. Anthony Ray Hinton was one of these uh, people, uh, when the people interviewed him, it was very emotional and very powerful because he had just been exonerated after being on death row for almost 30 years of his life taken away from him. And so a lot of the questions had to do with, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, there are questions of forgiveness, questions about, you know, how do you live after being incarcerated so many years? And it was a really profound experience for our students. But along with that experience of interviewing Mr. Hinton, was the experience of our students interviewing some of the staff lawyers for EJI. And what they said was something I wanted to share with you tonight about the importance of history and why history matters so much in the struggle for social justice. We interviewed a lawyer who had been working on the case with Mr. Hinton. And what he told our students, and a lot of our students are history majors, of course, and he said, you know, you guys are kind of deifying us and making us out to be a little bigger than we really are. He said, at EJI, at the Equal Justice Initiative, we think what you're doing as historians is the real heavy lifting, is the real important work. And this is why. When we have a person who's accused of a crime, like Anthony Ray Hinton, on the witness stand, and he's being questioned, and we watch the jury carefully to see how the jury is looking at him. They don't see him as an individual. They see him as a history. They see him as a history of dysfunction, of decay, of disease, of complete dysfunctionality. Because what most non-black people know about black history is either nothing or involves a lot of negativity. And this is why Equal Justice Initiative has spent so much resources in doing what? They published a major study of lynching last year. They're working now on building memorials and monuments to the victims of lynching throughout the South. In fact, one of the monuments is possibly slated from the county just to, to the south of Alachua County, where, where, where we live. And what the lawyer said is, you know, that's why you're doing such incredibly important work. Because what, what they're telling, what the EGI lawyers said is until we can change the historical narrative that our clients have to operate within, what we do as lawyers is a lost cause. We can have all the facts on our side. And check this out. Anthony Ray Hinton, you know how he was convicted of this murder? It's a convenience store murder. He was at work the night and the hour this murder was committed. His employer came and testified on his behalf. And he said, I knew Ray couldn't have committed this terrible murder. And the, the uh, prosecutor said, how do you know that? He said, well, I have his time card. He hedged a little bit. And finally, he came out with it. He said, look, I run a warehouse. I work in a very thin profit margin. Now, workers don't make that much money. They steal from me. I lock the doors. Anthony Ray Hinton was locked in the warehouse when this murder was committed. He could not have committed this crime. And we interviewed Mr. Hinton about this. We interviewed the lawyers. And we said, you know, well, what did the judge say? Nothing. But Mr. Hinton remembered that the judge, when he passed the death sentence on him, smiled. He said, that man looked at me with a gleeful smile, sent me to death for a crime I did not commit. But was able to do it, but the facts didn't matter. The facts of the case, that is, didn't matter. They should matter, right? But they didn't matter because the historical narrative that the jury was working with, the judge was working with, was so false. And this is why history is really important. And if you want to call it radical history, if you want to call black history radical history or Latino radical history, call it that. Uh, but in this particular case, this is why EJI has been funding historical studies 
And if you look around downtown Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks <coughs> is from Montgomery, right the Montgomery bus boycott, you'll see something amazing that this group of lawyers has block by block been building what I call a wonderful black history perimeter. <laughs> the monument, the marker to the slave, the enslaved people of Seoul, the slave market. You know, the Rosa Parks monument here, Martin Luther King monument here. You know, and other aspects of black history. In other words, they're trying to get white people to understand that black history is their history. It is not an alien history. Uh, and this is something our students have discovered in, in working, you know, being out in the field. And so this is the interview with um, Anthony Ray Hinton. Very emotional experience. Two of the people sitting on the right-hand side are members of the Dream Defenders uh, and gained a tremendous amount of, of energy, I think, from this interview. And in fact, those students that were in the, in the 2011 project I mean, almost right after Trayvon Martin was murdered, that was a core of students who went on that trip who actually founded the Dream Defenders chapter in Gainesville. Not because of who, you know, the project or what we do, but simply being in contact with people like this, being in contact with movement activists. What do you do when a crisis like this happens? If you know people involved in the SNCC Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, you organize. But if you don't know about the organizing tradition, you just get angry. You just get upset. You may post something on Facebook, and that's it. But if you're in contact with people that have organizing legacies, you can you can imagine, you can think about uh, being involved in it as being an organizer. So a few of the other projects that we that we work on, and I, I passed out, uh, you have leaflets going around. One of the projects is the Latino Diaspora uh, in the Americas project. And this has given our students really space to talk about issues that in their communities, and a lot of our students come from Miami, a lot of the Latino students uh, come from Miami Dade. We have a lot of um, Venezuelan students. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor for the Venezuelan Student Association on campus, and people say, we didn't know you're Venezuelan Ortiz. I say, no, I'm not. So you can't find anyone else to do it. But our, our Venezuelan students are, are transfer students, or working class students, you know? Um, and they're transfer students from Santa Fe College, which is the community college in our hometown. And they're using LDAP, this project we started a few years ago, as a place to interview First generation immigrants, you know, labor organizers, you know, uh, Latino faculty, um, all sorts of different types of people. But what I find interesting is the metaphors that are being used by our students who do oral history work and then do some activism. And they're using family <coughs> metaphors. They're using, if you look at the, the leaflet, uh, the metaphor family comes out loud and clear over and over again. Uh, the metaphor of acceptance comes out. Uh, uh, statements about love, community, belonging. And these are really interesting things and very important things and in, in integral to people like Richard Lainez. And Richard is a person who wants to let people know, I'm Latino, but I'm also queer. And I'm not going to um, hide one part of my identity in favor of another identity. Although, when I was growing up, that was something I felt I had to do. But now he's part of a larger community of people in the LDAP program uh, and in the University of Florida. I should say a lot of things have changed in Florida. Um, regardless, we, George Bush or, or Jeff Bush or you know Marco Rubio. Um, one of the things that's changed is that the second, third generation of the Cuban diaspora is completely reopening this question of identity and is said to people like Marco Rubio, um, who we've all seen his career crash and burn, literally in the past two weeks. Um, but the generation of Cuban Americans now in their 20s and 30s, um, I don't want to overstate the case because there are exceptions to this, but that generation has largely told Marco Rubio, your politics are obsolete. We've had it. We're tired of fighting the same Cold War over and over again. 
And I'm not saying those politics are completely out of gone in Florida, but Marco Rubio discovered the, very, the, the hard way. You can't go to Texas the way you could in the early 60s with Cold War politics using Fidel Castro as your foil. You know, what, regardless of how you think of uh, Fidel, pro or con. My father, by the way, was recruited to take part in the, in the Bay of Pigs invasion, 1960. I fought in Central America, Special Forces, against people who looked like me, who share the same surname, largely because of this Cold War situation. Uh, Genesis Laura grew up in the, the Dominican Republic in, in a place where the United States invaded the DR, remember, to avoid what? The Fidel Castro style revolution. So people in the 20s and 30s now are saying, we're no longer going to allow you to make us pay over and over again for these Cold War politics. One of the really signature LDAP projects was taking students to Tucson, Arizona last year. And the students were in a year-long course which focused on the importance and the centrality of ethnic studies. And I'm sure a lot of you know what's been going on in Arizona. There's been this amazing backlash to that. And so this is a program in Mexican-American studies that was banned a few years ago. And our students decided they really wanted to figure out what was going on here. And so they started, uh, Genesis Laura actually was the first student that went, did a number of interviews on the ground in Tucson, talked to teachers, talked to students, talked to some faculty who taught, like Sean Arce, who actually was the founding coordinator of the Amer Mexican American Studies program, to find out what, what, what was it about this program that on the one hand was so mm -hmm. successful with the students, these high school kids, if you know anything about Tucson, like South, there are these huge um, divides in, in Tucson between the, the Chicano, Mexican-American community, there's class divides, uh, there's police issues. And this program, the Mexican-American Studies program, was had a demonstrated success in working with underachieving Mexican-American high school students. It helped improve their, it helped lower the dropout rates, high school dropout rates. It helped increase their GPAs. In fact, if you look at these studies, you thought, wow, this, th th these are rigorous studies that prove the effectiveness, the importance of ethnic studies. And yet, the school board did what? The state legislature did what? They essentially banned the program. And when they were asked why you're banning the program, and, and, and even, even the district judge was, was astonished by this. He said, you know, according to these statistics, uh, ethnic studies actually is improving these students' uh, educational performances, leading to better educational outcomes. And the school board people said that doesn't matter. The issue here is curriculum control. And the judge was actually pretty appalled by that. So our students wanted to find out what was going on in Tucson. So they went, they did a lot of great preparatory research that allowed us to um, go and do interviews with a lot of, of high school students who had been part of the program, a lot of the teachers, and you, you want to talk about pushback. Very interesting pushback. In fact, one day, about a week before we left, and we did this as kind of an alternative spring break trip, we had been trying to call the school board there for a week you know, for weeks, you know, and they got no response. And one day, a representative from the school board called my office and asked me who had given us permission to interview their parents. And I said, excuse me? And, uh, the school board official said, you have no, I, we have not given you permission to interview our parents. <laughs> and I said, your parents? <laughs> Or our students, you know, your students? Okay, I can kind of understand that, you know. Um, that there's issues of, of consent, informed consent, you know, working with minors, so on and so forth. But your parents, you can own parents? So you say that. Um, but a lot of pushback there, but again, the community support allowed us to do 
this work. And those of you that do oral history understand that we don't work just with individuals, but the community support, support is integral to what we do. And a community in Tucson of, of Mexican American educators said, and, and this was this is kind of reminding me of what the EJI people said. It's very humbling to hear these types of things. It reminds you how much responsibility you have. They said, we need your students to come in and do this project because we need people from the outside to come in and give credibility to what we are doing. Um, and they told us this on, on several occasions. The other thing they told us was that when we would go in and interview and talk with high school classes there in Arizona, we initially would be scheduled to be there for one class period. I, didn't, I said very little. It was our college students who did the most talking about their experience, their struggles to get to, to the University of Florida and be successful college students. We'd finish that session and get ready to leave, and the teacher would grab us, sometimes physically. You can't leave. I want you to talk to the next group of students. We stay with the next group. Um, they want us to stay through lunch. Can you stay for lunch? And what, what they told us in the end was, we even talked to one administrator, said, we never have Mexican-American, we never have successful Mexican-American college students come and talk to our kids. We have Mexican-American cops. We have Mexican-American Marines. We have Mexican-American soldiers come and talk and give recruiting pitches. We've never had just a college student come and say, hey, uh, I'm a junior at the University of Florida or Arizona State University, and, and um, it's been a struggle, but, you, but because I can do it, you can do it. And that was an aspect of the interviews that we never even banked on. We never even thought of that, but that it turned out to be maybe the most important part of talking to young people. And that's what we discovered in the context of doing kind of movement histories is we don't just want to talk to veterans of movements in the 60s and the 50s, but talking to people now is really important. Talking to young people is absolutely critical. Um, and and a, it led to a lot of really good experiences. Uh, this is a picture of our LDAP team that went to Tucson last spring. Had a lot of struggles uh, to get there. Um, we did have some administrative pushback uh, for this particular project. Um, it was not a project sanctioned uh, by the authorities, if you will. We did talk to their parents um, in, in, in Tucson, uh, but it was an amazing experience for these students. And getting back to what I said in the very beginning, I could list for you the senior thesis projects. Brittany Mejia in the middle there is finishing a senior thesis project, a senior honors thesis project uh, in the question of the importance of ethnic studies for high school students in Miami-Dade High School. So she's taking what she learned in Tucson and applying it to her, her high school history. Uh, Genesis, who's uh, on the left here, you saw earlier in that, in that photograph uh, with Margaret Block, the SNCC veteran, uh, is a first year history PhD student at UC um, Davis, uh, writing a dissertation on the revolution in the DR in the early 60s. And the hopes and, and, and the the goals that the revolution had before the U.S. invasion. And she's interviewing family members. And these are some of the first real candidate uh, discussions she's had. And she told me recently that a lot of her family members wouldn't talk about the invasion, the U.S. invasion, because it was so traumatic. Um, but now that she's a college student, she has a little more cachet, and she's a little older, a little more mature, uh, some of her elders are actually talking with her about that experience. Jonathan Gomez, uh, to my right, um, is a student who I think Lelani knows uh, from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he's finishing his dissertation on Chicano mural art and Chicano punk music in East Los Angeles. And how the politics of the Chicano movement in some ways were driven underground, but talking to artists and activists and muralists and punk musicians, um, the police drove a lot of those politics underground, but in many ways they went into alleyways. They went into private parties. They went into punk venues that no one could figure out, you know, where are these punk bands playing and performing it, right? Um, so Jonathan came and joined us on that trip. Uh, Jocelyn Padron Rosinas 
who's in the very middle next to Brittany, the first Latina student government president in history of the University of Florida. And again, not because of anything that I'm doing or the Proctor program is doing per se, but because those students have created a community through their oral history work, which has just given them a tremendous amount of self-confidence, um, which has allowed them to do well academically, but also to begin to think about changing the system. Uh, Brittany Hibbert here, who is right here, the young African-American student, uh, is doing uh, Teach for America this year in San Antonio. Uh, very interesting uh, project, but went in with a critique of TFA. Right? This is not going to change the system, but this is what I want to do now to learn more about what's happening, what, you know, how kids in Texas, students of color are really struggling uh, with the system. And let's kind of wrap things up. Um, the importance of talking to movement activists and organizers, you see Genesis Laura with Alan Cooper, who's become a friend of our students over the years. And what's happened over the years is our students who go out and interview state veterans or veterans of the Chicago rights movement or the labor movement or the feminist movement or what or different movements uh, end up forming their own relationships and friendships. And I've discovered that a lot of our students actually regularly uh, uh, text their narrators back and forth. Now, you can see with my phone, I can't really do anything with that. I swear I can't text. But I'm finding out that our students are texting like 75-year-old SNCC veterans. <laughs> like Alan Cooper. Isn't that interesting? You know, they're, that is, they're forming relationships. I talked earlier about the importance of peer learning, right? To me, one of the great things that happens in a oral history program, and I know Amy and Mary will echo this, is how the students teach each other, right? In some ways, we're facilitators in, 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 in as best as we can. But the students, you all teach each other. You learn more from, you learn as much or more from each other as you ever will from us. And that's really important. Um, that, that's a critical oral history skill. It's a critical movement skill as well. But what I'm finding out is these students are having, are you know, kind of having these kind of intellectual relationships beyond the interview with their narrators. Uh, I love Alan Cooper. He's a person who, uh, very active, you can see the Veterans of Peace Pen. He's active in a number of different movements. He can tell you how the weapons were brought in during the Windy occupation. You know, he has that knowledge. Um, and he's a person who has given a lot of testimony to our students. And he's problematized the issue of nonviolence versus violence because he was savagely beaten uh, by um, Klan members of uh, Mississippi in the 60s. And he raises the question of, you know, is nonviolence always the best thing to do? It almost got me killed. You know, so he raises some tough questions that, that our students go in and talk about. This was a kind of an offshoot of our Mississippi work. And you'll see here attorney John Dew, who is standing to the right, is talking to high school students. And how this happened, this is a, um, a parallel project our Mississippi work, our work in the Mississippi Delta, uh, John Dew took voter, just talk about the Voting Rights Act. This is a man who took depositions from African Americans in Alabama and in Mississippi in 1963 that went <coughs> into the making of the Voting Rights Act. Okay? And he's lived long enough to see that work what? Dismantled by the US Supreme Court. Isn't that? What does that say about this country? Now, he, I don't have to answer that question because he's talking directly to high school students. It's not anything I'm saying. It's something that he's saying. He's giving, and, and look at the outline. And I want you to remind me, this is for a high school class. Now, did the high school kids understand all of this outline? Did I understand all that? Okay. But to, to give this kind of learning in, in a high school class, this is Macomb High School. Macomb, Mississippi High School. And the resonance there is that this was a high, this was a, a city that was the key that SNCC used to get into Mississippi to plan 
Freedom Summer, but it was the local activist Macomb that made that possible in 1961, 62, 63. In other words, Macomb was SNCC's beachhead in the Mississippi. And it was high school kids who were leading that effort uh, in the early 1960s. But the current students of Macomb High School were not really aware of that history. So someone like John Dew comes in um, and is able to share that history with them. They begin to think, wow, people my age were key activists in a social movement. That's very interesting, very important. Um, and these are just a couple photographs of, of the students. Uh, and they're actually documenting the workshop. And you can actually look at the Zen Educational, um, what's that called? I mean, it's a Zen Educational Forum. Uh, it's an online, they do curriculum on the Civil Rights Movement and other movement histories. Um, and Are you seeing this training ourselves? No. It's, it's the Zen Education Project. Oh, you can, Zen. Yeah, Zen. Zen. I'm sorry, yeah. And you can find the Macomb Project uh, through the Zen Education Project. Um, and so the students in Macomb, this is a special grant to actually the Kellogg Foundation, will learn how to document the civil rights movement in Mississippi. And so you can see they're filming it right there. And then do podcasts, audio podcasts, digital um, audio and video podcast and media documentaries. And the woman we talked about literature earlier, that woman standing right there is, is Tanana Reed Dew. That's John Dew's daughter. Tanana Reed Dew is one of the great up and coming uh, African American science fiction writers of our time. Some people are comparing her to Octavia Butler. Uh, she's writing, in fact, she just finished a, a, a zombie novel with African Americans as the protagonist and using the zombie genre to open up a lot of really big social issues. But you have Tanneri Du talking to young people about writing, you know, in, in high school. I wanted to kind of conclude on a, a couple of projects. One, what oral history allows us to do. And I passed this around to the class earlier, but I'll pass this around again. Um, we were approached by a professor in Canada, a law professor. And this was just a few, when was this, in August. And I was just starting my sabbatical. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have a whole year just to work on this book. And then all of a sudden, people started calling. This is one of the first calls. And uh, he said, uh, Professor Ortiz, I know you've written about CLR James. Um, we have a tape. It's been floating around now since 19, what do you know, the early 1970s. And um, it needs to be transcribed. Robert Hill, who's Sealer James's literary executor, has said it's got to be transcribed and published in the New Politics Journal, and that's it. Um, and no one is, knows what to do with this tape. We can't really pick out the voice. We think it might be CLR James. What, what do you want me to do with it? And I said, give me the tape like right now. <laughs> don't, you know, special delivery. Don't mess with it or anything. So we discovered that the recording had been made in the early 70s. That was true. And the audio quality was so poor because at some point as this tape was being passed from person to person, I, I, this story just boggles my mind. Someone, in an attempt to woo a lover or a potential lover had recorded a, a soundtrack of 70s soul music <laughs> <laughs> over the CLR James lecture. <laughs> and so you would listen to it and you could hear CLR in the background, right? And, uh, and then you'd hear like Isaac Hayes <laughs> or Marvin Gaye, you know, over it. And it was just so, but anyway, to make a long story short, we were able to, to, to digitize and to restore this, this tape to a point where we could actually transcribe it. Now, it took a whole team of people to transcribe it, but what we came up with was something that was really, to me, was really, again, humbling and moving. Uh, it, it provoked tears. Uh, it was CLR James talking about giving a lecture at the Institute of the Black World in 1971. And those of you familiar with the Black Freedom Struggle know that 
the IBW was this amazing place that came out of, as SNCC was kind of declining, uh, some members of SNCC, including Vincent Harding and some others, went to Atlanta, founded this place called the Institute of the Black World. It was very active for several months before the FBI found out about them and began rifling through their records, breaking into their office, all those dirty tricks and things like that. But in between all of that government suppression, the IBW was able to bring in people like C.L.R. James, like Walter Rodney, like Sylvia Winter, these amazing activists from the Caribbean and from the African freedom struggles in the 60s. And so James came in 1971, and I've taught courses on CLR many times. And what I taught for all these years was false. I taught that when he came to the IBW in 1971, he gave three lectures. The first lecture was How I Wrote the Black Jacobins, which is a lecture on the Haitian Revolution, the finest work on the Haitian Revolution to this day. Lecture two was a careful comparison between the Black Jacobins and W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction two greatest English language Marxist historical texts that we have. The third lecture was, if I were the Black Jacobins today, 1971, how would I write it now? That is, CLR wrote the book from 35 to 38, published it 38. So he's asking people how, he's asking himself, how would I write it today? And the people in the audience in the IBW are students like ourselves, they have the books, and they're trying to connect their classroom learning to the world around them. They're trying to make connections to social movements in the early 70s and what they're learning in this black studies space. So in many ways, they're doing what, we're, what you, you all have been doing in oral history. That is, you're learning stuff at Columbia, but you're also thinking about how can I apply this to the outside world? If you don't think Columbia is the real world, I'm sure Columbia is the real world, right? <laughs> But their, their predecessor, your predecessors in 1971 were listening to CLR give these lectures, but the lecture that we found that had been lost was this full-on lecture about Oliver Cromwell Cox's work, book, published in 1947, called Caste, Class, and Race, a classic in the study of racism in the United States, maybe one of the finest sociological texts on the study of racism. And the fact that we're able to, to transcribe that and to make sense of it, we did an annotated introduction, and you know, we'll talk about it more at Verso tomorrow night in Brooklyn, uh, and how we kind of put, put the annotations together. That's what we can do as oral historians. We can bring together the past with the present. We can talk about what it was like for people to gather around that table and give a talk. And we can transcribe that. And we can try to make sense out of that. Now we have that, by the way, we've been finding a lot of things. Now I know at Columbia you're always finding old interview projects, right? <laughs> you didn't know you had. The other thing we recently found was a discussion in 1981. The great Frank Franklin scholar Francis Bebe, the great Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe, and the great American novelist James Baldwin came to Gainesville, Florida to talk to each other about black political struggle. We didn't know we had this, and so we recently transcribed it. And what our students are going to do right now, that I don't know. We're going to do a public program at some point. We're going to just play this. We have the audio. The audio is actually, no one ever tried to record Marvin Gaye <laughs> or James Baldwin. <laughs> Heavens, right? It's a very clear, crisp, professional recording. But what people are going to make with it, I don't know. But I think they're going to make something with it now that's going to be quite interesting. When you think about the Black Lives Matter movement, when you think about the Dream Defenders, when you think about the Occupy movement, when you think about the energy by the Bernie Sanders movement, when you think about all of those young, I can remember moving to Florida, my wife Sheila and I, in the summer of 2008, and talking to a lot of young Cuban American students who were the, for the first time in their lives involved in a presidential election and organizing and canvassing in Miami-Dade and Broward and Fort Lauderdale. And they were canvassing and working on behalf of a senator by the name of Barack Obama. And for them, that was a revolutionary activity. 
I don't care what any of my friends from Berkeley or Seattle say, when you campaign for Barack Obama as a Cuban American student in 2008, that in, in Florida, in South Florida, that was a revolutionary activity. Because you had to talk to your family about what that meant. And you had Familia who said, well, how can you do this? The man's a communist. <laughs> and, they, and they said that uh, to, to their kids. And the kids did something which I never would have thought of to do as a kid, which is to talk back to your parent, to, to your parents, and say, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, abuela, you know, you know this man's not a communist. It's because he's black, isn't it? We need to have an internal discussion about racism in our community, in Miami-Dade, in Fort Lauderdale, in Tampa. Uh, and those discussions about racism have, have really, again, percolated and connected to other forms of oppression uh, in Florida. Nikki Giovanni recently came to, to Gainesville, and the person interviewing her was Randy Bill Sadler. She's a graduate student, one of the project programs for our research coordinators. She herself, uh, you all know the work of Nikki Giovanni, you need to begin to learn the work of uh, Randy Gil Sadler, because Randy is writing a wonderful English dissertation on African Americans and the struggle against imperialism in the Caribbean, and focusing on the, the war in Grenada, the, the, actually the U.S. invasion of Grenada. But oral history is, you know, she's using oral history interviews with Nikki Giovanni and with others to open up, you know, these kind of intergenerational um, dialogues. You can see my use of Facebook. Right. A lot of people think I spend too much time at Facebook. But there's interesting things, you know. And, and to be honest, if I have to be honest with you, the CLR project was made possible by Facebook. I think CLR would find this to be highly amusing. I think he'd laugh about it. But that was how I was initially contacted, by the way. This Canadian professor was a Facebook friend. He contacted me through Facebook and said, I've noticed, you know, you do this stuff on CLR. So I think CLR would approve of that. And the last slide I'll share with you is that we're always digitizing and restoring works. This is one of my favorites because this was a documentary that Churchill Roberts did as a student, as an undergraduate. He's, he's really a very renowned filmmaker now in Florida. He did a wonderful film on Harriet B. and Harry T. Moore who were assassinated by the Klan in Florida in 1951 for being voting rights organizers for the NAACP. But Churchill came up to me one day and he said, Paul, did you know I did a, a film about the sanitation workers' strike? And that was in Memphis during the strike? I said, Churchill, you never told me that. Where is the film? Oh, it's on an old Betamax. Does anyone here remember Beta? Yeah. Okay. So now, thanks to the technology that we have in oral history, because I have to do the digital humanities pitch, right? Um, <laughs> we can digitize this stuff. <laughs> But what we do with it now, um, we, we have to do more. And I guess my main frustration is we have a lot of great material. We have it on a YouTube station. We need to get, more, we need to get this in the hands of more people because it really has some really amazing um, footage. But I have talked entirely too long. Um, and I want to leave time for, for Q&A. Uh, and I want to thank you for your, your patience and, and perseverance. Sheet. If you're not on our mailing list and would like to be, feel free to add yourselves. I have a question to start off. You know, there's it can be hard sometimes to draw parallels between different moments of, of a protest, of insurrection, of organizing, um, because. You know, the, the struggle is continuing, but the moments can be really different. So how do your students do that in conversation with, with their narrators and also sort of as they translate that into, into contemporary activism? Well, I think a lot of times when they're talking to people who are involved in, you know, say, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or the labor movement. We have some interviews with people who have been activists in the farmers movement. And 
they often connect to people, but their, their narrators also connect to them by beginning with the statement that, you know, I wasn't much older than you when I did this stuff that you're reading about now. Uh, I was very similar, you know, and so narrators often begin that discussion themselves before our students even begin that, 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 that discussion. And they're trying to kind of bridge differences. Um, the other reason we've been able to get a lot of people to talk to us um, in, say, you know, the African American History Project I worked in as a graduate student. Um, I worked in the Behind the Bill uh, Oil History uh, Project, which became, you know, I think we picked about 75 of our interviews that went into Remembering Jim Crow. And that moment of doing field work was equally fraught because this was 93, 94, 95. And a lot of the African American elders that we spoke with, and, and remember the premise, those of you who have read Remembering Jim Crow, the premise is we were working on a project on the African American experience during segregation, what it was like to grow up in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And many of those interviews, if you actually go back and listen to the, the, the whole interview, begin with, the reason I'm sitting down with you today is that I am just terrified of what's happening in this country. And, and people would say, and, and the big thing in 94 was what people would call the, Re the Republican Revolution. And they say, you know, we heard Newt Gingrich say these things. Do you think he's serious? And the reason I'm talking to you is that I want you to understand what we had to go through to improve this country. And now we see it all unravel. And that, that's the beginning of so many oral histories, Amy, that, that we did in 93, 1993, 1994. And I don't think we appreciated it enough back then. If you look at what's happening now in North Carolina, we did a lot of those interviews in North Carolina. Um, and again, it seemed ca almost counterintuitive because you know, even a young radical could be forgiven for thinking in the early 90s that well, we made a certain amount of progress, we're just going to kind of keep on going. But people who are in their 70s and 80s and older were saying, we're seeing the society slip badly, going backwards. What's happening? We want to make sure that you know what we went through to, for us to reach this point. Um, so that's kind of what comes up, what came up quite often. And what, what still comes up, I think, today. Now, a lot of movement organizers are beginning, have not just beginning, but are responding to the fight for 15, the dream defenders in Florida, and they want to talk to you know, movement organizers. And so those intergenerational discussions are happening um, in, in the Wall Street context as well. We just had a big conference at Duke in the fall, for example, and SNCC made the decision to donate part of its archive to uh, Duke Special Collections. But the SNCC activists, um, the people involved in this, like Joy, uh, there's Ladner, uh, Robert Moses, uh, Charlie, um, I'm blanking his last name. I should remember this. Well, anyway, some of the senior SNCC activists said, because Duke was begging them. As a grad student, I went to Duke. That's where I did my degree, so I can tell you that school can beg for a lot of things, even though it's very wealthy. They were begging the snake activists for their papers. And so the snake activists said, we'll give you our papers, but you have to sponsor a series of, of meetings with us, between us, and members of the Black Lives Matter movement, and movement scholars, because we don't want these papers to just sit there and only be used by professors. We want this material used by students, you know, by community organizers. And so that opened the space for those, those kinds of discussions to happen. But that's what I mean by, I think, movement organizers from, from earlier struggles are beginning to really reach out to younger people. And in Florida, we saw this as well when the Dream Defenders um, did the big sit-in at the state capitol and really stopped Florida politics as usual. And it was the first time that it happened in many years. So older people are beginning to kind of really initiate those discussions. And our, our next event in this series, <clears throat> April 14th, is about the SNCC project um, at Duke. So.
Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. I really, um, your, your interview was incredible, and, and it really followed into your talk. So thank you. Um, my question is, um, sorry, my head's like spinning right now from all the information. Um, my question is, in the beginning of your talk, you opened up with the question um, of how Black Lives Matter started, was um, students asking, young people asking, do I really have a future in this society? And that being the driving force for what is happening now in, in colleges and universities. With students speaking up, and why oral history is so important. My question is, um, James Baldwin, in an inter interview before he died, said that that our society, it, this is in 1984, that our society is currently in a, in a struggle between white people losing their power and people of color becoming, uh, coming into the majority, which is kind of actually what's, what's happening, I think, and maybe you have comments on this, but that's not my question, with um, Donald Trump uh, becoming now this force out of nowhere. Um, and my question is, what do you imagine to happen in, to be a force in the future. What do you imagine to happen next in the future in terms of this movement happening, especially when the presidential election is such um, at, in our vision and also with like young people being very much like Bernie Sanders supporters. Um, and, um, sorry, I'm like almost losing <laughs> the train of thought. <laughs> um, and how do you, uh, oh my God! I totally lost it. I'm so sorry. But yeah, that was that, that was that was that, that that was basically the essence of the question. Um, James yeah. James Baldwin just, was asked this was asked these similar types of questions like, where do we go from here? What's going to happen next? Oh, revolution! It's going to be revolution. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> James Baldwin, let me riff on this for a little bit, because what Baldwin said it, it in so many ways explains what's happening now with, for lack of a better term, the, we'll call it the Trump Revolution, okay? So a lot, of a lot of angry people together, really angry at something, trying to get their country back. And we cannot ignore that. That's very important, because if we're, if we're political thinkers, we have to figure out, well, what's going on here? But I think James Baldwin has a lot to tell us, and we're forgetting a lot of his very prescient words. This is what Baldwin said. He said, do you know what the Negro problem is? Does anyone remember this? Any of you Baldwin readers, aficionados here? James Baldwin would say, when you start talking about the Negro problem, it's not about you if you're black, or me if I'm black. You know, he said, this is, not the time of the souls of black folk, mm -hmm. with all due deference to Dr. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop thinking of ourselves as a problem. Remember how Dr. Du Bois, in that wonderful Souls of Black Folk, talks about what does it mean to be a problem? Mm -hmm. Okay? James Baldwin tries to exercise this in his discussion in his, his wonderful essay to his nephew, mm -hmm. right? The Fire Next Time. He says, really, what is the Negro problem? The Negro problem is that white people don't love each other. They hate each other. They can't get along with each other. And until we can find a way to get them to kind of see that, that their anger is not, that we're just convenient scapegoats for them. The problems they have are not with, even necessarily even with the government, the problems they have with each other. And so what Baldwin would say, well, it, but, but at the same time he said, it's not your responsibility to tell them that. But somehow we've got to get that through to them. In other words, your problem is not going to be solved by building that wall from the higher. Now I can make a lot of I can make political hay out of that, building the wall. But isn't just Trump. Why do we have a six hundred mile wall already? <laughs> Trump had nothing to do with that wall. 
And you know how many people lost their land for that wall to be built? Do you know how many animals lost their habitat? Do you know how many wetlands were destroyed to build the stretch that we have now? It's what, 658 miles long? And, and because people, it isn't because people think that Mexico is, you know, I can talk about this for ages, but again, it, will, will there be a revolution? Yes. We've had revolutions before. This economic system we have is not going to last this century. I'll guarantee you that much. Now, am I going to be around to see the end of the economic system? More people now are, ch are challenging the economic system, not just here, but all throughout the world. In Africa, what are they doing now? Uh, we're, my wife Sheila and I were just at the UN yesterday. They're building a wall in Africa, 11 nations. But it's a 4,000 mile wall of trees, of bushes, of plants. To me, that's revolutionary. I, I thought, my God, this is incredible. Because they're trying to stop the, um, what is that called? The, the desertification, this is not my area, but to think about a group of 11 nations getting together and building a wall of trees, my God, that is revolutionary. And I think of one garden that tie, the great Nobel laureate from Africa, and, and the, uh, the, what is it called, it's not the tree building movement, but her theory is that women's rights depend upon the rights of nature, and, and habitats, and so she would teach these workshops. She, she was in San Jose, actually when I was in San Jose, I missed her, but she was teaching people that if you want to do something about women's rights and get communities together, you plant trees. And she started in Kenya, and she, she grew this movement all throughout the world. Uh, but that, that movement's happening, you know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you for this profound talk and your question also, it was so stimulating. Just on the theory that Trump came from nowhere, don't forget that he was the one who incited all the upset about Central Park Five. That's how he came to prominence, and he incited the mass media uh, to to force confessions out of these young men. And um, so he's been around. And I, I love your comment about this being or your translation of all of this idea that this is being about white people, not for whoever you cited. Not loving themselves. I remember Cornel West said to me one time, I was checking one of his courses, there is no white culture. <laughs> and this is your problem. You're always, you know, in the language of world history, projecting. Donald Trump is projecting his hatred, you know, which is his ignorance and his, his lack of identity um, onto others and, and penalizing and pathologizing them. Yeah. I just think that that your presentation tonight is all about history. It's all about looking to the past to understand the future. So we must remember that Donald Trump does come from somewhere, and whether or not he calls a wall, he now wants to build a bigger wall. Yeah. And this is dangerous, and all of us should be on the streets. As so world historians, and that leads to my last question to you, Paul. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently in thinking about world history, advocacy, social justice, is questioning whether we have really used our history to make a change in the political sphere and looking at civic issues and civic dialogues and interfacing, facing down government itself. You know, like a lot of movements I've been in have done that. I wonder if we as our history historians are neglecting that, or are we doing it or not? Then you're the person I must love to hear it from because you've probably done it. Well, I think, I think um, and some of the examples that we picked, and I talked to some students before I left, um, interviewing people who are active in, in movements that are unfolding is very important. And if I think about, you know, SNCC, uh, remember that wonderful little book, The New Abolitionist by Howard Zinn. Um, when you talk to SNCC activists now, and, and the book was published, I think, in 1965, right after Freedom Summer, I believe. And um, it's important to talk to people who are in struggle because it helps them, it helps us understand what this broader struggle is really about. And I mentioned to the class earlier, and I can't remember if I talked about it in my general talk, that's how I started in world history was interviewing people around me who were involved in the boycott of Chateau Saint-Michel Wines that the United Farm Workers was in the middle of. And that's uh, actually where my wife, Sheila, was in that struggle. 
Um, we got arrested together. We saw a lot of things happen. You know, I learned, you know, what does it mean to be an organizer? But and that's kind of how I got started, was just interviewing people around me, you know, workers, boycott organizers. Um, and the more we talked to each other, the more we began to, you know, I think it helped us clarify our thoughts about what we were doing. It didn't help us come up with any kind of roadmap uh, or, or plan, if you will. But I think talk, even today, uh, we were at the Tenement Museum, the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. And I, it was very moving to hear the staff talk about how you know everyone has a history. Now I've heard that so often as an oral historian. You know, everyone has a history. You know, sometimes it's the premise you get to, to, for someone to sit down and, and, and allow you to record them. Um, my sense was they really mean it there. You know, at, in, in that space, they're talking about people who, who live and struggle and strive. And one of the wonderful questions that the, the docent was asking us, when, and we were a multi-generational cohort all the way down to, I think, probably the youngest person maybe in a third or fourth grade, and then, you know, uh, middle-aged folks. And the docent asked, as she was taking us through the shop, which had been, you know, a tavern in the 19, I think, the 1890s or 1880s, she'd ask a general question. She'd say, do you think this couple, this family was successful? And we had to think about that. And it ends the narrative, I hate this, this is going to be kind of a plot spoiler. Um, the narrative ends with the family, you know, eventually they're going to die, right? So eventually they die. And she tells us what they died of and how the family had kind of fallen down a bit in economic hard times. And I don't know if I'm answering your question specifically, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the more I started thinking about her questions, the more I started imagining what it was like to live in the 1890s as a person struggling in this place and not quite knowing what the outcome is going to be. And you know, you struggle because you you know you're trying to, to find a better life for you and your family. That's the premise that got me to the labor movement. It was that. It was a group of farm workers who said, we want the right to vote for the union of our own choice. You know, they, they weren't talking about changing the political system or you know, impacting uh, a political election. They were talking about the right to join a union. And I know that having people talk with them about that and take them seriously was very important. Uh, because most people didn't take them seriously at all. Even people who normally, you know, could have been seen as being allies. Because by the time we started working with that union, you know, labor was out. You know, no one, no one became a labor organizer. Um, the first picket line I was ever responsible for maintaining, uh, and this will kind of date me, was the 1990 Greyhound bus strike. It was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. Um, we knew we were going to lose the strike from the very beginning. But again, the drivers would say, well, why are you involved in this? What, what, what does this matter to you? And I remember I would give them books of labor history that I was reading in college, you know, and they'd say, wow, we've never seen this. This is really interesting. And these are bus drivers, mainly, you know, uh, white guys in their 50s and 60s. I lost a lot of books during that strike. Um, but it had a big impact on, I think, both sides. They were like, you know, we've been trying to get so many people to, to join our picket line, we just can't seem to get anyone out to help us. And this corporation is just killing us. And, and don't people understand what's at stake here you know, if we lose this strike? And I had to say to them, I'm sorry, but I, I just don't know how to get a bigger audience for you. But this is what we can do. We can retell your narrative, we can retell your story. And what I'm glad to say now is I think that audience is bigger. Now, is it because of the work we do in oral history? We kind of like to think that, um, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that the stories are being told and retold at a much higher pitch than they were, to borrow an old analog metaphor. When I use the term tape, by the way, my students laugh at me, because I still use that term tape. They look, 
well, it's tape something. Like, tape? What's that? Like duct tape? <laughs> but the recording, um, or I guess the, the, the retelling of narrative, to me, is very important. And, and it kind of dovetails with your question, Merrick, which is that if I'm an isolated movement organizer working in the Mississippi Delta or Northern Florida or Eastern Washington, when I hear someone that takes the time to learn my narrative mm -hmm. and to try to repeat it to the outside world, you know, that makes a big difference. It, it's what we call um, you know, solidarity in many ways. And, and I can tell you in my generation, the greatest blow to, to our social movements was forgetting that very important lesson of solidarity and the relationship building, listening, those types of things that we do in oral history. Uh, again, whether you're, it doesn't matter if you're left or right, you know, the isolation we feel in, in society. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I was wondering, um, you're working a lot in, in Florida, in Mississippi, um, and my family initially being from Montotoc, Mississippi, but being Chickasaw natives and being removed, and knowing that indigenous children, indigenous young people share a lot of these same issues, um, but it doesn't seem to be part of this. I'm wondering if there is a sense that there's a place for solidarity or for indigenous youth to become involved um, in these same type of programs, you know, dealing with mass incarceration of indigenous youth, dealing yes. with the educational struggles of indigenous youth, and even what would be very interesting is to see them go back to places like Mississippi and kind of like bring that, bring that voice into it. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that type of solidarity or if you're working on it. Uh, yeah, that's my, yes, that's it's, my question. It's a great question, and I would invite you to check out the, um, oh, this didn't come up, right here. I clicked on a project that we've been doing with the Porch Band of Creek Indians in southeast Alabama. Um, we recently were out there, right there about two weeks ago, and we started doing interviews with members of the tribe in the early 1970s, and recently um, digitized those and retranscribed those interviews, because we discovered that the transcripts that were done in the early 70s were off. We didn't have a style guide back then. And I, I can't get back in the mindset of the people transcribing these interviews, but they weren't that good. Okay. So we retranscribed them, and they actually, the tribe now has an event they call Evening with Elders. And every, sometimes every month, sometimes every other month, depending on what's happening in Porch Creek, Alabama, um, they get people together and they play an interview. And they pick a topic, and so the topic could be mass incarceration, or it could be the important, you know, the impact of religion. It could be health issues in the tribe, um, and they just play an interview, and they'll play excerpts, two or three excerpts from the interview. They'll share a transcript from the interview, and then what's impressive about the Evening with the Elders program among the Porch Creek Nation is that they involve all elements of the community in it. So there's a space for you know, high school youth to be involved. Uh, they do readings. There's a space for the, the little kids, you know, the, the little types. Um, and then, but the elders obviously are kind of the center of the attention. But many of the elders that were, that they're playing in these tapes have long been, have long passed away. But so they use that evening with elders as a space to get to some of these issues that you're talking about, you know, the importance of tribal history. Um, I would love to replicate that, that, that project um, because as you're saying, these issues are every bit as important in Native American communities as they are in any other community in this country. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, I really appreciate your connection between movement building in uh, community organizing and in social movements and oral history and was particularly particularly enjoyed hearing about the Tucson trip and about the fact that some of your students or mentees are still in communication with uh, veteran SNCC members by text, shall we say. So I guess in that theme, I wanted to ask um, this idea of family that you talked about regarding uh, young activists and the way that they looked at family and at that form of 
of building movements. Um, what you've thought about that in relation to your work as an oral history educator, uh, some successes, challenges, and favorites for that. Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, they're, they're building new types of, of family, I believe. If you look at the, the Black Immigration Network mm -hmm. meeting, which is going to take place in LA um, later in the spring, um, and, and when, I, when I look at our students who are involved in these movements, say the immigration, immigration rights struggles, Black Lives Matter, Dream Defenders, they, I think they're using family metaphor because of what they're not seeing the broader society. Mm -hmm. They're not seeing, you know, they're seeing politicians, they're seeing a lot of, you know, even university types talking about, you know, things like, you know, success, how to be successful. Um, how are you successful in the society? When I mentioned Jocelyn is the first um, African or the first Latina female student government president in the history of the University of Florida, this is what she had to. This is what she was up against. To be very candid with you, she was up against a political machine at the University of Florida, which has always been I'm talking about student government, which has always been dominated by Greek letter. Societies. I'm sure you have fraternities at Columbia, right? Okay. UF, they're, they're very old fraternities, not, probably not as old as the ones you have here, but they have had a lock on student government for generations. So Jocelyn's group actually invokes that term of family to create connections between students, not just Latino students, but if you look at the slate of students that rang in, it was Latino students, African American, Asian American students. White students were not part of that kind of old Greek letter society or fraternity, if you will. And they used family to talk about each other. They used those types of metaphors because I think for them it was the most powerful metaphor they could use. I mean, I might use the term organized, right? They use the term family, um, if, if, that, if that makes sense. But they invoke it, they mean it. And, and um, now where they see me in that, I don't know. Um, the daughtering, Grandfather or oh, something? Or I, I guess where, where do you see yourself as a mentor building community? Where do I see myself? Well, um, I mean, I learned organizing. You know, I turned on the TV one day uh, early on in the First Gulf War, and I saw um, a woman on there, and it said she was a community organizer. And I said, well, I want to find out what that is. What is that? And it turns out to be my wife now. She always standing in that. Um, and what I learned in community organizing was, you know, you have to, to have a intergenerational space where people come together. And if I can be there and just kind of listen to people and not even, you know, like say anything to me. And every once in a while, my students and Dream Defenders will call me and ask me a question. Like, <laughs> last night I got a, a, a Facebook message. Can you tell us a little bit about... Um, a little bit more about the Emmett Till case. That was interesting. So I talked a little bit about that. So they, they call me when they when uh, whenever they, they need to, but I'm not going to try to um, tell them what to do. I guess again, Howard Zinn comes up as a, as a role model because I one of my colleagues at UF, Wendell Zahar Simmons, who was a great SNCC organizer. Those of you, that, if, if you haven't had the chance to read Hand in the Plow wonderful book about women and SNCC. And so, so Horace Simmons, back then she was Wendland Simmons, was the this, this SNCC project leader in, my God, um, Laurel, Mississippi, for a year and a half. How many times is the Freedom House bombed in Laurel, Mississippi? How many times did the Klan come by and shoot into the house? So Zohar held that house, held that together as part of the movement for a year and a half. But before that, she was a young African-American female student at Spelman College. When she went to Spelman in 62, I think it's 62, or maybe 61, her parents made her promise not to get involved with that mess, as they call it. Because you were there as a first generation African-American female student to go to college and to make something yourself, right? None of us, your elders didn't have that, that opportunity. Don't waste it. And her administrators, talk about administrative pushback, an issue we talked about earlier, her administrators at Spelman said, 
If you get involved in the movement, you're gone. You're expelled. She was <clears throat> lucky or unlucky enough to have who as her professor? Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn. <laughs> but better than that, Scott Lynn. A twofer. Imagine <laughs> Scott. And when I learned about this years ago, I thought, what? Howard Zinn and Scott Lynn's professors? But when you hear Zohara Simmons today talk about what Howard and Scott meant to her and to the young ladies at Swell, and she says, you know, look, Howard never told us to get moving. He never lectured to us about what we needed to be doing as young African American women in Atlanta. But he was with us whenever we engaged in an activity and we needed an adult to be with us, he was there. Now that's the kind of behavior that I guess I try to model, which is I can't tell my students today what direction to move in, the issues they need to deal with. Um, at the age of 52, I've learned, you know, the older I get, the less you kind of know kind of thing. Um, but I think of people like, like, you know, Howard or Stottenland or Manning Merrill was another tremendous impact on, on many of us. And a person who, if you, Cedric Robinson, I'll finish with Cedric because I think it's appropriate in, in terms of the family metaphor. Cedric Robinson, we're finishing a volume right now. He wrote a wonderful book called Black Marxism in the early 80s, a groundbreaking book, which brought back Franz Fanon, Walter Rodney, Sylvia Winter, all these incredible activists. And each of us over the years, and, and Cedric retired from UC Santa Barbara um, after decades of struggle of, of establishing black studies in the University of California system, which my God was a hard struggle, right? And we took turns, we'd go to Cedric, we'd, uh, we'd complain to him. We'd say, Cedric, um, you know, I'm teaching this class in ethnic studies at, at Santa Cruz or Gainesville or Columbia, and my, my chair has called me a reverse racist because all the students are black or Latino or Asian, and they've never seen this before. They've never had a history class where all the students were just Latinos. And you'd say, just? What does that mean? And we would take our complaints to Cedric. And you know what he would say to us? He'd say, Paul. I'll never forget this. He'd say, Paul, why are you looking for love in a place that doesn't love you? <laughs> He'd say, if you want that kind of space, you've got to create it, right? And so that's what we try to do in the Proctor program. That's what we, I know you try to do here. You try to create a space where a kind of family can exist, a kind of love and respect and solidarity can exist. Now, is it perfect? No. Is it contested? Yes. It will always be contested. Uh, but I guess it's my kind of elliptical response um, to, to the question, which is a very important question. Well, it's definitely a space where we love you. <laughs> 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 you know, like, you know, Our next event, April 14th, is with Wesley Hogan, who runs the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke. And she's going to be talking about that SNCC project. Excellent, um, yeah. So it should be great. I hope to see some of you back. Um, and again, if you want to be on our mailing list, the sign-up sheet is here. And thank you again. All right. Thank you. Check us out in games. If you have any questions, our email is on the brochures. We'd love to talk with you. Thank you.